Our next lesson starts again with a, a major scale. We've had C major scale, F major scale, G major scale. Now a very common one is B flat major scale. B flat major scale has two flats in the key signature, a B flat and an E flat. Uh, B flat major scale. another B flat, here's an E flat. So I will play uh, the exercise that states the B flat major scale. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Here's something you might find interesting. When a key signature has two or more flats, the name of the next to the last flat is the name of the key. In other words, we have B flat and E flat in the key signature. The name of the key is B flat. It's, it's the next to the last flat. We'll be going over that again later on with some more flat keys. Rhythm accompaniment, here we are with minor chords and we have a different rhythm. Let's look at exercise one. Not even the chords, let's just look at that rhythm. It's one, two, three, four. Da, 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 dum, da, dum, dum. F minor, if we know F major, difference physically between F major and F minor is just flatting the first finger on the first three strings. The root is in the same spot, first string. B flat minor, if we know B flat major, that's the area, the, the root is on the fifth string, B flat minor. We're going to bar our finger across the first string to the fifth string. Uh, but we're only going to be hearing B flat and F, and we're filling in the notes with our other fingers. And G diminished. Here's a form, a basic diminished form that actually you have been playing in already, reading this form in a, in a um, chord A2 that we had two lessons ago. Look at me play exercise one. One, two, three, four. Exercise two, the same chords, but up a whole step. We're just transposing them up. G minor, C minor, from F minor, B flat minor. Here it is. One, two, three, four.
On page 51, in our duet, this is where we're going to be playing a melody on the top line, and our accompaniment, the bottom line, is chords. We don't have any written notes for our second line, our second part. But first, let's just look at the top part. In general, before we even start this tune, it's in the key of B-flat. It's moderately slow. And we also have a first and second ending. Remember, when you play a first ending, you go all the way to the repeat sign, going back to the repeat sign again at the beginning playing through that and skipping the first ending and going to the second ending. Here is duet in B-flat. One, two, three, four. Of course, you're going to have to play the B-flat major scale over and over again to get used to it before you really can play this uh, melody smoothly. So go back to your B-flat major scale and know where those B-flats and E-flats are. We have... Um, some rhythms here that we have had already, but it's good to mention again. We have the dotted quarter, eighth note, second measure, one, two, three, four. Again, dotted quarter. Then you have the half note, A, tied to an eighth, A, going to B flat. It's one, two, three, and four, and and I will remind you again, when you count these, you always, I always think about where the next entrance is of the note. So the B flat comes on the and of three. So I go one, two, three, and four, and. It's always good to aim for the next entrance. Another reminder about the first and second ending, make sure you repeat, and then when you play, skip over the first ending and go to the second ending and our actually our B section uh, we have an A section which is the, the melody and the first going through the first through the second ending at the end of our second line the last measure starts our B melody and our A melody repeats in the last eight measures, but this time an octave lower from what was written at the beginning. The melody at the beginning was right, and our melody at in the last eight measures is so. 
So practice this part slowly. Here's the second part. One, two, three, four. This piece, playing the chords, takes a lot of strength. And the way I would practice this is a little at a time. I would just, first of all, put the metronome on and look at the rhythm and take just a B-flat chord just and lightly play it, trying that rhythm. seven chord you know that even without looking at the music just try and get those rhythms and then rest your hand and then after that while you're building up speed and endurance you can play for a longer period of time Not all the notes come out now, don't worry about it. Just make sure you start remembering what the chords are and just play these rhythms. In the second measure of the second line, that F7 is a broken chord, it's almost arpeggiated. Try and don't do it too slow so it uh, and you come in on four on the last beat. The D7 you've already played C7 a number of times in this in the first fret, D7 is in the third fret. On all these chords we have the diagram to remind you where they are, and also the Roman numeral to tell you where, the, uh, what fret that the chord is placed. G minor, third fret, D7, third fret, C7, first fret, F major, F7, B flat. If you're having problems with the chords, don't skip this piece. Learn the melody really well and then slowly build up your strength to be able to play the chords. One, two, three, four.
page 52 reverse alternate picking study I will play this first and then I'll talk about it one two three four I want you to play that first because this is one of the hardest pieces in the whole book. This whole thing of reverse picking takes a lot of uh, practice. For me to get ready for this study, I just took the C scale and I started with an upstroke on C and I held G down with my third finger as in the fourth line third measure and I just practiced the C scale with repeating the note G on the bottom I also practice the first line by playing those first two measures and then practicing the third and fourth measure. When we start the reverse picking in the third measure, it is very important to play the note B open the last note in the second measure with a downstroke rest stroke. Mm -hmm. So we go B and then just bring the pick up on C in the third measure. So I'll play the second measure. And then the C up. So here are the third and fourth measures. And I would practice that over and over again. Till I get used to it. And the way I know that I get used to it is that my right hand starts to relax and I don't feel a lot of tension in it. This exercise is a very important exercise to always come back to so that you strengthen your reverse alternate picking. In fact, 
practicing your reverse alternate picking will actually strengthen your regular alternate picking because it just strengthens that right hand so you know where the strings are and your right hand gets more relaxed and more knowledgeable of where it's going. On page 53, we start a new scale in the new key. We played the key of G already. Our next scale is the key of D. The key of D has two sharps, an F sharp and a C sharp. We know the G scale has an F sharp. So now all we have to do is add a C sharp to that scale. And I'll start on D so you can hear it. D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C sharp, D. And the top of that page, 53, shows the D scale in the whole first position. Let's play it together. One, two, three, four. If you have problems playing that, play the exercise as quarter notes. Always a steady tempo. And so on. So always remember the key of D has the notes F sharp and C sharp in it. Right after, right before it says duet in D, it says in any sharp signature, the first note above the last sharp is the name of the key. That means that we look at this last sharp, we have F sharp and then we have C sharp. C sharp is our last sharp and the note that follows it is D, C sharp to D. In other words, from that space we go to the line it would be the key of D. Or best, always know that the key of D has two sharps, F sharp and C sharp. Duet in D, the first part. One, two, three, four. Well, the first thing about this part is that it is in the key of D. So, again, before you start playing this duet and practicing the first part, review the D scale. See where all the notes are. Once we know the D scale, the next thing to do is to look at the rhythms. In measure three, we have an E half note tied to an eighth note E, followed by a D C sharp B. Make sure the note E sounds for two and a half beats. And what do we aim for? The D 
is comes in on the end of three. One, two, three, and four, and one. Then the next measure, the same rhythm. One, two, three, and four, and one, two, three. We see that rhythm happening a number of times in this piece and also in the second part. The other rhythm that we should be looking at is the first measure in the third line. Eighth note B, quarter note G, eighth note A, and so forth. Look at that first measure in the third line. The G comes in on the end of one, the A, the A comes in on the end of two, the B comes in on three. One, two, three, four, one, and two, and three. If you can't figure out a rhythm for a whole measure, it's good to split up the measure in half and go for the first two beats and then the last two beats. One, two, three, four, one, and two, and three. And of course, it looks like, and it is, the same rhythm in the second half of that measure. So it's, that's the first half of the measure. The second half of the measure is same note. So it's one and two and three and four and. One and two and three and four and. And that and of four goes right into the first beat of the next measure. I will play that whole third line. The last three notes on that last measure of the third line again come in on the end of three. C sharp, D, D sharp, E is the first note on the fourth line. Okay. And the other explanation I would like to say is in the last measure of this piece, the first note, the D, there's a little dot over it. That means staccato. Staccato means to play short. In other words, that D you play like an eighth note. I will play the last two measures. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. And... If I were to play it as a full quarter note, it would go one, two, three. All right, so whenever you see that dot, you would play a note very short. So now it's your time to practice the first part. Part two. One, two, three, four. In this part, remember we can't come in on beat three. So it would be one, two, three, four, one, two. Remember the A flat in the third measure. In the bottom part, the rhythm of the half note tied to an eighth note happens in a different part of the measure than happens in the first part. In the first part, it starts on beat one. In the bottom part, it starts on beat three. And our entrance with the next note comes in in the end of one. Here, the last two measures on the first line of the bottom part 
going to the first two measures of the second line. One, two, three, four. One and two and three, four. One and two and three, four. One, two, three, three, four. One and two and three, four. One, two, and so forth. The other thing that you really have to work on with this part is the use of your fourth finger on your left hand. We have it for all our C sharps. We have our nasty G sharp in the second measure of the third line on the bottom part. And any F sharps, again, are played with our fourth finger. So play it slowly and try to get a legato smooth sound. And what will happen is that your fourth finger will get stronger. And that is the only way it can get stronger, not just playing it with the third finger, always avoiding it. Use your fourth finger because it's very important to be able to use all four fingers. Now it's your turn to play part two. One, two, three, four. Dynamic Etude, Part 1. One, two, three, four. So the name of the piece is Dynamic A2 Duet. So what happens? We have to look at the dynamics of this piece. P means soft, MP means moderately soft, MF moderately loud, F loud. So we try and make a distinction. And also we have some decrescendos and crescendos. We have a crescendo at the end of the first line we have a decrescendo 
at the beginning of the second line on the second page, on page 55. A long crescendo on the third line of the second page, page 55. The main thing here is to try and make a difference between loud and soft. Then we can start getting a difference between soft and moderately soft, and then moderately loud and loud. But first, practice soft and loud. The main thing is that you're thinking about it while you're playing, and it will come out more in your music if you notice it while you're playing. The other part with this piece is that you usually have two lines going. You have a whole note in the first measure. That should be held throughout the whole measure. And on the third beat, you come in with the G. It's one, two, three, four. It's not one, two, three, four. It's one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Now, the last measure in the first line is very hard. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. It's hard to get that E ringing throughout that whole measure. At least have it come up to the C. In the third line of the first page, on page 54, The C is played on one, and that should sound throughout the whole measure. If you can get it to at least the third beat, that would be good. Then you have the note G on the second beat, and then you have the higher G, one octave above, on the third beat, and on the fourth beat, low G again. Make sure that that G and that's on the fourth beat rings through to the first beat of the next measure. In the last line of page 54, your turn to practice this part. Part two, dynamic duet. One, two, three, four.
We start the second part with four measures rest. And instead of just counting one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, let's count it like this. One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four, two, three, four. So we're counting the measures as we count uh, the number of rests we're playing. So we're marking the measures. One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four, two, three, four. Then we have the C chord on two and a higher C chord on four. So I would hold the whole C chord that we know like this and go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, then one, two, three, do rest strokes so you're not going like this. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two. In the third line we have this rhythm. One and two and three and four and. Remember in the in the previous duet I said many times it's good to cut the measure in half and practice the first half of the measure and then the second half of the measure and usually simplifies that rhythm. The rhythm really repeats itself in each half of the measure. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and The other rhythm that's fairly difficult is the one in the last measure of the third line. One and two and three and four and one. One and two and three and four and one. Again, it is the same rhythm repeating itself in each half of the measure. One and two and. Three and four and. the top of the page, on page 55, on the bottom part we have this. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Same rhythm, the second two measures, different notes. One, two, three, then. In the second line, we do that wonderful thing called reverse alternate picking. We have a repeat sign for the third measure. One and two and three and four and. If you notice, we have two repeat signs in two measures. That means that we play this figure three times on that line. And on the next line, to remind you what the figure was, you, it shows it and then we play it another two times. We play it a total of six times. So I go one, two, to myself, three, four, five, six. Of course, when you're playing the duet, you can also keep track of where you are by listening for the first line. When you hear that means that you're playing this phrase two more times. Now the hardest part here includes the last line and the first measure of the line before that. We have this chord and we have this chord. Well, I would just hold the whole thing and get ready for the G. It's really a C chord. And do it slowly. Everything comes on the end of the beat. One and two and three and four and. Then it goes to a small G7. 
and the first measure of the last line, one and two and. That's as far as we'll take it right now. One and two and three and four and one and two and. And then that C chord comes on the and of three, followed quickly by two eighth notes on four and. One and two and three and four and. One and two and three and four and. And that goes right into the fir first ending, repeating to the line before that, looking for the dots where the repeat is, and then jumping to the second ending. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and second and two. We have a molto retard, meaning slow down mucho, slow down a lot in the last measure. But we're not going to do that since we're playing a duet and you will be following it in time. But you can practice it by retarding that first ending. One and two and three and four. Now it's your turn to play this part. One, two, three, four. Page 56 starts another key. We just did the key of D. The key of A has another sharp. It has G sharp. Key of G has one sharp. Key of D has two sharps, and key of A has three sharps. The sharp that we're adding is G sharp. There's G sharp on the third string. Here's G sharp on the first string. Here's G sharp on the sixth string. Key 
key of A major, first position, duet in A. One, two, three, one, two, three. If you notice, this piece is in three, three, four time, three beats in a measure, the quarter note gets one beat. It's a waltz. What is good when, to do when you play something in three, four time, in waltz time, it's good to emphasize the note that comes in on beat one of each measure. Instead of playing this where you're not sure of where the meter is, it's good to emphasize one, so you hear it as a waltz. You feel the time this way, you feel the phrasing this way. And it's much easier to count, and it's much easier to play the duet with someone when you do this. So remember, there's different emphasis on notes when you're playing different time signatures. The first thing you should always do is make sure you can emphasize the first beat of each measure if you have an attack there. Okay, this is in the key of A. We have G sharps, F sharps, and C sharps. G sharp, F sharp, C sharp. G sharp, F sharp, C sharp, G sharp, F sharp. And it uses most of the notes in that whole position, this just the top part. There is really nothing, anything tricky about this other than playing the G sharps with your fourth finger, playing in the key of A, emphasizing the first beat in each measure, and also the last two measures in this whole piece, it goes one. You notice how I slide my first finger on G sharp to A. That way I can flatten it and get the C sharp with the first finger and reach for the A on the first string. two measures. One, two, three. One, two. Now your turn to play this part. Part two. Duet in A. One, two, three. Bill Levitt always wants you to exercise your fourth finger. There are some fingerings in this part that you could do an easier fingering. 
in the last measure of the first line, you can play the open D and play the D and the B with your second and third finger. But no, it says three and four. Why? It's to build strength. So you might have to build strength and dexterity in your third and fourth fingers. In the fourth measure of the second line, we have the D, and then we have this little B minor chord. Very difficult. I had to practice this a lot to get this clear. It's much easier to play one, two, and three instead of two, three, four. And then going for the C sharp with your fourth finger. See that? So the last three measures on that second line. Right. And since I have my fourth finger on D in that last measure, the first measure of the last line, I go to C sharp with my third D. I do this. That way, our first finger now is free for the G-sharp. So the last line goes like this. Right, then. Then we play an A, and then we just play the first four strings, second fret and hold that A. This one will take some time to get it nice and smooth. Continue on with the lesson, but keep working at this exercise so that you get it nice and smooth and you'll find, you'll have a, feel a difference in this left hand. Now it's your turn to play part two. One, two, three, one, two, three. bottom of the page of page 56 is rhythm accompaniment again we know some of these chords but let's review C minor third fret F minor G7 C minor let's play it one two three four if we can play that exercise two is just a whole step up or two frets above everything that we just played in that first exercise D minor G minor a7 D minor this is for you to get this feel and the concept of movable chord forms. One, two, three, four. This book moves pretty fast with keys. So on the next page, page 57, we're in a new key, E flat. We've been doing sharps lately. We did the key of G. We did the key of D. We did the key of A. Now we're going to do a flat key, E flat. In, in the key of B flat, we have two flats, B 
B flat and E flat. In the key of E flat, we have three flats. B flat, E flat, yeah, and A flat. Let's play together this exercise scale, key of E flat, scale in first position. One and two, three and four and. We are going to use that scale in our next duet, duet in E flat. As it says here, remember the flats and count the time carefully. Part one. One, two, three, four. V flat, three flats. All our A's are flatted in addition to our B flats and our E flats. Let's look at the uh, first measure where we have again the first thing to do is to cut the measure in half. So the first two beats are one, two, three, four. One, two, and. And then the next half a measure is one, two, three, and four, and. One, two, and three, and four, and. One, two, and three, and four, and. And then we go right into that next measure. If you notice, we have dotted eighth and sixteenths. And at the beginning of the piece, we have moderate four. That tells us the tempo not fast, we'll keep it usually at the tempo that we've been playing. We've been playing fairly moderately lately. And it says swing feeling. If I were to play the second measure exactly as written, which would be dotted eight sixteenths, it would sound like this. One, two, three, four. <laughs> With swing feeling, remember, it's almost like a triplet feel. Just relax. As opposed to... The time that we play that feeling is when we have dotted eighth and sixteenths, and it says swing feel, or swing feeling, as it has at the top of the page here. The last measure in the third line, you have a C flat. Well, there are two different ways to play the C flat. C flat, one fret lower than one, is open. We can play open B like that. I chose to play it here on the third string, fourth fret, just like I'm tuning the, the guitar. So it's one, two, three. 
Make sure you get that triplet. It's one, two, three, four. One, two, three. The reason why I play the C flat with my fourth finger on the third string is that it sounds better going into that B flat. I'm actually preparing going down. You could play it. Either way is fine. Now it's your turn to play part one. Part two. It's really a chord chart. We have strums and chord forms. The only new chord form that we have is a B flat seven. Here, let me play it for you. Part two. One, two, three, four. The reason why I'm playing the swing or long, short, long, short, long, short. When I'm playing this type of rhythm, that's when the top part would definitely play the swing eighth notes. Da ba da bu da bu da bu. Da bu da bu da bu. So when it says swing feel, it's always this. In this book right now, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. The new chord that you have here is a B flat seven. It's in the first fret, the first position. So we have F minor. Don't move out of that position. Still first position. Keep your first finger barred, but not on all six strings. The five strings. So you should practice F minor, two, three, four, B flat seven. Two, three, four, E flat. The way to practice this at first is to play just whole notes and plan on where you're going. Now we're going to jump to the E flat in the third fret, and then the E flat augmented. That's it. Same measure. Uh, Same fret, A flat, A flat minor. E flat, third, A flat. Then I'll do two beats each here. Skip. Right now, you don't have to get every note ringing, but as long as you can hear some of that chord. In fact, most of the time, I don't hear the top notes because my, my right hand is sweeping, making a flick when I'm playing rhythm. I'm not going, I'm going. The main thing is keep a steady tempo. Don't slow down where you have to switch from one chord. I mean, this is not what to do. This is wrong. Here we go. I'll show you wrong. One, two, three, four. All right, you should do it as slowly as you can play it evenly.
now it's your turn to practice this. One, two, three, four. Page 58 is a very important page. We really don't have to play anything. Uh, there's no exercise on here. It's a chart, and it shows you important chord forms, movable chord forms. It shows 11 chord forms. If you know these 11 chord forms, you can play mostly any tune. For anything that says C major, over here, C6, C major 7, C major 9, C6, 9, C major 9, 7. You can play, simplify it, and play a C chord. Or this C chord. All right. This is a chart for you. If you get some music, I know some people play in stage bands. And you get this chord chart that has major 7 Let's do this. F7, F13, F7 flat 13, F7 flat 5, F7. Well, when I see all those, I could just play F7 for right now until I learn those chords, and you can still hear the tonality and the sound of the chord. So you can use this chord simplification and substitution chart when you're in a bind and you need to simplify the chords to chords that you know. Now, these chords that you have at the top of the page are related mostly in fingerings, so that if you play an F major, you know you can play an F minor, and you can play an F7, all within that area. If you know a B flat minor, don't move out of that position, then you play a D flat major, and again, a B flat seven. The next chord you see is E diminished, B flat diminished, C sharp diminished, G diminished. All the same chord. Uh, yes, you can call this diminished chord, the name of the chord can go from any note that you're playing. A G, a C sharp, or D flat, a B flat, E. C7. If we know it's C7, all we have to do is lift up our fourth finger and flatten our first and play the middle four strings and you get an augmented chord. This is like a diminished chord that any of the notes that you're playing can be the root or the name of the chord. It could be a C augmented, A augmented, or a G sharp augmented, or A flat. And then here's a note, a chord B flat major. Now, theoretically, this next chord really isn't as related to the B flat major, but definitely f physically it is, since we're flattening our third finger to get C9. We still have our third finger flatted across three strings. And the B flat is the second, third, and fourth string. And the C9 is first, second, and third string. Important. With these 11 forms, you can play the accompaniment to any song in any key, providing, number one, that you understand the principle of movable chord forms, go back to page 45, and two, that you observe this chart that we've been looking at. It's not the ideal way to play all chords in tunes. You might have to jump around a little, but it'll get you through the piece 
and then you can start to add more chords in your repertoire. Page 59, picking a different technique. Okay, we've been doing mostly alternate picking all the time. I'll read what it says here. Picking a different technique. The principle is to attack each new string with a downstroke. This technique is older than alternate picking and is less emphasized lately, but is really another way to pick eighth notes or to pick fast or to get a different type of phrasing. It is another step, as Bill puts it, in right hand control and when mastered is very fast, especially in ascending and in arpeggios. What it is, is mostly our rest stroke and just to continue with it. Instead of going, let's say we have a C chord, instead of going C, the principle of it is to go, see? That's with arpeggios, that's the easy part. The next part is to do it in scales. Anytime you come to a new string, you do a downstroke. Instead of, you can do you see it's like the gravity pushing your hand down people use this technique when they practice scales they practice scales and we'll be doing this another time but just to show you they practice scales with three notes on a string if we started with a downstroke, I'm going to play this. Actually, that's a G scale. What I'm going to do is make sure there are three notes on each string. I have to switch positions, but just to show you. be doing more of this. Let's look at the exercise in the C scale, open position. That's the principle. Look at my right hand while I play this. One, two, three, four.
As it says on the bottom of the page, there are, uh, we've been playing this picking technique in a number of different places just by following the music and the picking that's uh, shown in some of our exercises, as on page 48 in measure 20. Go back and look at that. It's under the endurance etude. This picking will be suggested in different pieces, especially arpeggiated pieces in the following pages in the book. But also, please remember, the most important one to get together is alternate picking. It gives you strength that you can do mostly anything and skip to anywhere you want when you're playing eighth notes, sixteenth notes, quarter notes, whatever music you're playing. It really gives you a feel of where the, the guitar is and it gives you very good clean technique. So we'll be playing both of these types of picking in the following pages. That is the end of part one of, of this book. That involves all the etudes, all the keys that we've been playing, all the chords, and in open position. What I do suggest now is to go back and review periodically. Uh, if you're on page 52 and you're practicing 52, before you start page 52, go to page 3 and start playing that again. Uh, pick a picking etude, that's a good one, pick a picking etude to practice every day. It doesn't have to be the same one um, and you'll start to get better and navigate well with your right hand and your left hand. This first section is essential to playing the second section. I know it sounds obvious, but many people just want to jump to the second section because they can understand what's happening in the first section. You need to play what's happening in the first section. Even when you're in the second section, go back to the first section. Review. Play the etudes. Play the duets. Review the scales. Especially the picking etudes are very, very helpful. Look at the chords. Do all the fingering. Master this first section even while you're playing the second section. But before you start in the second section, use at least a week of review of everything before you're ready to play the second part.